church before we even had offering. Janae, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. That was great. Well, good evening. It's uh, time to receive the tithes and offerings. Deuteronomy 16, 17. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee. Something for us to think about this evening. When we give our tithes and offerings to God, it should not be with the intention of receiving something in return. I'm going to repeat that. It shouldn't be with the intention of receiving something in return. It should be because the blessings he has already given us. And our offerings should be giving, given with a heart of thanksgiving. When we put God first, it will be evident in our everyday life, and it will also be evident in our giving. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please take these tithes and offerings and use it for your glory and to further build your kingdom. Please bless the gift and the giver today, and we ask all these things in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. 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 
worried about my wife and my children who come and stand behind me. A lot of people in here know my story. Some don't. But the theme of my story is uh, God's grace and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. Five years ago, um, I found out that I was in stage four kidney failure. And, you know, when I found out, it was like a shock to the system. But even then, God's grace and mercy followed me. Five years later, uh, right after that, I went into stage five uh, kidney failure, which is total kidney failure. I had to go on dialysis. And then all the hospital visits, um, my children having to see me go in ambulance several times uh, in the hospital and several times in the getting in an ambulance and seeing your kids cry, not wondering what's going to happen to you, um, that you're going to be okay, you know, but God's grace and mercy, because there was a few times my blood pressure was so high they didn't wonder why they didn't have a stroke. His grace and mercy was still following me. And I just want to uh, thank him for that. But moving on, you know, I still worked, even on doing uh, kidney dialysis until I got so sick that I couldn't work. And I was about four months into it trying to get disability because I had got so sick, I couldn't work no more. And I was sick in the hospital, and just all of a sudden, a lady that was um, studying to be a lawyer showed up in the room and helped me get disability. And I got it in three weeks. God's grace and mercy was still following me. And thank God for her. But I want to thank, I went to the mountains with the kids. And I should have listened to my body when I was in the mountains. But, you know, my kids have been through so much over the years. Um, it had been a while since we've been on vacation. I didn't want to ruin their vacation, but I was having bad problems in the mountains. I had got so where the, uh, my brother and my, my eldest son had to help carry me around. And at that point, I was angry with God. You know, God, why couldn't you at least let me just go to the mountains and just have a good time with my kids without being so sick? And his grace and mercy still followed me, even though I was angry with him. Three weeks later, on July the 7th, I was trying to get hooked up to my dialysis machine. I fell, and my wife uh, said the back of my head was hitting the dialysis machine like that, so she got behind me to keep my head from hitting the dialysis machine, and when she got behind me, my eyes rolled up in my head, and I had a seizure. And then right after the seizure, I went into cardiac arrest. Thank God my nephew was there and some neighbors. And my wife started giving me CPR and my nephew started giving me chest compressions. They got me back revived and um, the ambulance came out and got me and took me to the hospital. When I got to the hospital, I was uh, stayed overnight the next morning, it happened again. I had another seizure. I had a, went into cardiac arrest again, and then I had a stroke. I was on life support for seven days. My wife asked the doctor, is he going to make it through this? And the doctor told her, it's up to him. He wasn't really truthful. He didn't know he wasn't truthful. At that point in time, my life was in the hands of my Lord and Savior. His grace and mercy was still following me. And I pulled out of that 
seven days later with no major damage. And, you know, I was asking my wife what had happened. And because when I fell out in the room, I don't know nothing from then till the time um, I woke up in the hospital. All I could do was cry and thank the Lord for not taking my life. This is emotional. So, and I had to, when I got done with that, I had what you call PD dialysis. That's where they, you have a tube in your stomach, they drain your stomach, and they clean the fluid and uh, uh, clean the fluid, bad fluid out of you and put good fluid in you. And that had stopped working. That's why I had the seizures, the strokes, and all that. So I had to go on hemodialysis. So we had so many people. My brother, he made it to the last day. We actually had our soap, our cleansing soap, our other things for the surgery, and they checked him the day before the surgery, and he was like four pounds overweight, so he got nervous. So his blood pressure went up a little bit. Canceled the surgery. Devastated. It's only a year after I had went on, that was only a year after I went on dialysis. There were other people that were stepping up to try to give me kidneys. Get so close, so close, all the things. Something would come up, get turned down. You know, I was like, God, come on. Why, why is, you know, I know uh, other people that are getting kidneys in a year and two years. Why are you making me wait so long? Why are you making me suffer like this? But his grace and mercy was still following me because there was other times after that that I had to be in the hospital. And he, he still followed me, even though I didn't feel it at the time. He was still there. So fast forward. I, was, I just got home one day and pulled up in the truck, and my wife called me hysterical. Her aunt, which I'm very close with, when I met her, we've always been very close. Her aunt had got in a car accident and had got killed. And she said, can you pack the bags and have them packed? By the time we, you know, the time I get home, we can leave and go and be with the family. So when she, when she got home, we had the bags packed, threw them in the back of the van, and off we went. Wake Forest. I hadn't heard nothing from them in four years, not a peep. And we got halfway to Lomberton. If you guys don't know where Lomberton is, it's east towards the beach. Got halfway to Lomberton, and here's Wake Forest calls me. And says, we got a kidney for you. It was like getting a gut punch in the stomach. I didn't know how to, I mean, it was like, did I just hear that? So me and my wife pulled over to the side of the road. And we had this lady named Anna in the chapel. Most of you guys in here know her. She had been working over a year to give me a kidney. I'd lost 45 or 50 pounds, and we were right there. She had done a pass through all the tests. She had like five or ten more pounds to lose, and she was going to be able to give me a kidney at Duke. So we pulled over the side of the road. I called her. I wasn't going to take the kidney, so I called her, and asked for her blessing. She gave me her blessing. She said, if they got a kidney for you, you take it. So first we talked to the coordinator, and the coordinator, the information she gave me, I just wasn't all together with it because she said the guy died from a drug overdose. So she had the surgeon call me back. Said it was a 34-year-old man, and nothing happened to the kidney. And she specifically picked that kidney out for me because of my age. God's mercy was still with me, his mercy and grace. So I said, what do I need to do? He said, you need to turn around. You need to come to Duke. <laughs> turn around, headed back to the house, unpacked the car, and kept mine and her bags in the car. 
and we headed to Wake Forest. The next morning at 7 o'clock, I was in surgery for the new kidney. And the surgery that's supposed to take 46 hours only took two. When they hooked the kidney up, they said I immediately started urinating. And I hadn't urinated in over two and a half, three years. God's mercy and grace still follows me to this day. And I can't sing, but I think this song fits me perfectly. So I'm just, I'm not going to sing it. I'm just going to say the words to it. And it says, with what the Lord has done, he healed my body, he touched my mind, he saved me just in time. And that's what the Lord's timing is. It's not on our timing, it's on his timing. I don't know what the Lord has in store for me, but his grace and mercy saved my life, and I have my life owed to him. And as I get more healed and get more uh, energy back, I will pray and figure out what he's got in store for my life. And I just thank the Lord for him and thank the Lord that he touched my life. Thank you. I don't talk, but I got to say something too. God has been too good to me for me not to. Um, we battled and we battled and we battled, it seemed like, all the time. And God made a way every time, every time he made a way. He was faithful. Even when we worked, God was faithful. And although Brian has his kidney now, and things look different on that aspect, we still battle. We have young people, and like Janae said, sometimes you can touch the very closest ones to you. So we still battle. But I just want to let you young people know tonight, the devil is a liar. He will not have my family. They belong to God. They don't belong to me or him. And I'm trusting God. I know he has been too faithful. He showed me too many things to let me down now. And so we should encourage these young people. We should encourage them to keep pressing on, keep pressing on. And I choose to believe that it's the rain, that our, our people aren't here tonight. Because we should be behind you guys every step of the way. And if I'm, if I'm ever needed by any of you guys, ever, no judgment, no anything. Only tell your parents if it comes harm to your life. But if you need me, I am here for any of you. I promise you that. And I love you guys. I forgot, but I do have some people that I want to thank. Um, first, my church family. All the prayers and the financial help that had been sent to me during this um, hard time. Uh, my church showed up far beyond what the, they are supposed to do. Um, I want to thank my parents. Uh, you know, I could see the times when my mom would go to me to the hospital and see what kind of pain I was in. I could see it in her eyes. She wanted to take that pain and put it on herself. My dad, um, it wasn't a couple of days go by, he would always call, how you doing, son? Are you doing okay? And I got a family here that uh, I just built a sunroom for them, but they've been such a big part of my life, um, mentorizing uh, everything. And they're Mr. and Mrs. Randolph. They are special people to me, and I want to thank my rock because she was there every night on them late nights and work and she is special and I want to thank my kids because they have been through a lot and just thank you guys thank you for letting me give my testimony
out in the darkness of this lonely pilgrim land raise a strong and mighty fortress says I alone command but this dream I constructed by the strength of my own hand are just temporary kingdoms on foundation made of sand in the middle of the battle I believe I finally found I'll never know the thrill of victory till I'm willing to lay down all my weapons of defense and earthly strategies of war so I'm laying down my arms and running helplessly to I attain if I measure my successes on a scale of earthly gain. If the focus of my vision is the status I obtain, then my accomplishments are worthless and my efforts are in vain. So I lay aside these trophies to pursue a high crime should you choose somehow to use the life I willingly lay I down willingly lay I surrender down. all the triumph for it's only by his grace I relinquish all the glory I surrender all the praise belongs to you this life I live is not my own I believe us on Isaac from the sacrificial fire if all I have is all that you desire I surrender of the Lord again tonight. Amen. Let me just uh, say while you're standing and turning to 1 Kings chapter 10, let me say to uh, you as a church, thank you for being in the house of the Lord tonight. Thank you for this weekend. We have thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. 
And we are honored to have received this invitation. Our prayer is, is that somehow that we've been able to drop something in somebody's life that will help them another day. And that will encourage you and strengthen you to continue to walk in the faith. To earnestly contend for the faith that it's worth fighting for. And so I just want you to know how much we love you, thank the Lord for you, and appreciate you so much. And uh, thank you for the, the gift that you've given us. And uh, we are honored. Had a wonderful afternoon with our pastor and first lady. Just great fellowship. One of a kind couple. And uh, we thank God for them. I want to preach to you tonight from verse 13 of 1 Kings chapter 10. The Bible says, And King Solomon gave unto the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked, beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. Amen and amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word of God tonight. Amen. Let me commend this youth group. You can be seated. Let me commend this youth group for your worship tonight. You bless me. Amen. All of our musicians tonight. Tremendous job. Um, there's something about it whenever you've got good music. It just sets the stage for preaching. That's why I jumped up here a little bit early. I'm ready to go. But uh, thank the Lord for the opportunity to be here. I want to begin with verse 1. Of chapter 10 and you can follow along with your Bible but the story tells us that Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon and she heard of the kingdom that he had built and she heard not only of the kingdom and the fame but she heard of the wisdom of Solomon she wanted to know more about this man. I need some help. Will you be my Solomon tonight? Would you help me? Yeah. You can sit right here. It's going to be an easy job. Yep, you can sit right there. You can even do the thinking pose if you want to. Just, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Solomon had become famous in all of the land. And here we have a queen over Sheba that wants to know some of the wisdom of what he has. She has to have some understanding. The Bible says she begins to question him. She begins to talk to him and ask questions because she's looking for answers. And so Sheba comes. Sister Sheba, would you come? With all of her entourage... And she comes into the palace of this great man, Solomon. You can stand right there. You're going to have the toughest job tonight. And so Sheba stands in the presence of Solomon and she begins to question him and ask questions that she needs answers to. She doesn't come by herself. She comes in all the royalty. She comes with all of her her throne and all of her people with her. Her entourage is with her and I can imagine the pomp and the circumstances. She comes into the kingdom and Solomon greets her and invites her in. The Bible said that she was overwhelmed whenever she got there because she had heard of the royalty and the majesty of Solomon's kingdom. And the Bible tells us that she was fascinated with the royal palace. She was fascinated with all the banquets and the feast and all that he was able to do. Fascinated with the officials of his kingdom and the servants and their royal clothing. She was fascinated. She was taken back. And the, the approach that she took to him was an even approach of humility. She comes to him and she admits to him that uh, she's overwhelmed and she's fascinated and she comes looking for those answers. 
where there is wisdom she begins to seek and she comes choosing Solomon to give her those answers. But she doesn't come without gifts and treasures of her own because she wants to come and she wants to bring something because she wants to pay for this wisdom. She wants answers to the questions of her life and so she brings these gifts to entreat Solomon to give this high authoritative wisdom into her life. And so she brings all of these gifts and all of these treasures from her land to offer as an offering and a payment for the wisdom that he's going to pour into her life. Sheba questions him. She gets answers. She's overwhelmed. And she begins to thank God. She begins to thank the Lord that Solomon is there. And that Solomon is is a man that is ruling and that God has chosen him to rule over Israel. She begins to praise the Lord for his love for Israel. She praises the Lord for establishing Solomon as king to maintain justice and righteousness in the land. She thanks God for this individual that's full of wisdom She honors God as she's honoring the man. And she comes, gives all of these gifts, gets all of her questions answered. And then she, the Bible says that she left. She left. But before she left, here's what the Bible says that Solomon gave unto the queen of Sheba all her desire. Whatever she had asked, he gave to her. Beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty, so she turned and went her way. He gave her everything that she asked for plus. I want to preach to you just for a few minutes here tonight on this thought. It won't cost you a dime. It won't cost you a dime. What we have here is a picture of a believer looking for answers in their life. Sheba represents the questioning of our lives. She represents the one that would say, God... I don't understand why it's taking so long. God, I don't understand why I'm having to go down this path. God, I don't understand why I'm having to fight this battle. God, I don't understand why I'm having to go through this trial. God, I don't understand. Could you just give me some wisdom, God? Could you give me some understanding? Can you give me some answers to my questions? Can you just give me peace of mind? Can you just give me something that I can leave with? That I can go back to where you've called me to be and so that I can can have peace of mind while I live this life. That's what Sheba represents. But you see, Sheba brought gifts thinking she needed to pay for the wisdom. But I've come by tonight to tell you it won't cost you a dime to come to Jesus. There are questions in your mind. There are things that we will have questions about. There are things we wonder why. There are reasons that we would have to come before God and ask Him the questions. It is not wrong and it is not a sin for you to ever question God. It's a sin when you charge God foolishly. But it's all right for you to come to God and say, I just need to understand. I just need to know. I need you that if you can't give me an answer, just give me peace. Sheba represents our lives coming before the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords. She looked at him and said, man, you're a wise man. I've heard a lot about you. That's what the sinner does. 
this sinner hears about Jesus and, and he comes and he asks the questions and he lays his soul down before God and God answers those questions and gives him hope that he can continue to live. The believer continues on trusting in that same God that saved them from their sin and knows that God is the answer to every question of life. There are times that I don't have answers for people. There are times that their questions far go beyond the wisdom that God has given me. And even we can't find a viable answer in Scripture, we still trust God. We wonder why. We question things, no doubt. Sheba comes to the king and finds her answers. Young people, you can come to the king and find your answers. I may not be able to give it to you. I may not be able to find it in Scripture, but the Lord can give you your answers. Oh, He's not left us. He's not forsaken us. He's not left us out to our own understanding, but He's given us the wisdom of the Word and the power of the Spirit to reveal the Word unto us. And He's given the peace where there are no answers for us right now. There are some things that we just don't have answers to, but God gives us peace about. Sheba gets her answers, gives her gifts, and then she gets on her way. But let me, let me say this to you. It was customary in this day and this time that any time that there was a lower kingdom approached a higher kingdom and they were received well, that the higher kingdom would always give the lower kingdom a promise of security. They would give a promise that if you ever need help in the middle of your battle, all you've got to do. There was often a gift. A gift that the king would give somebody. I'm sorry, I just dropped that. You're not supposed to get that yet. Not yet. We're not there yet. But there would be some token that would be exchanged from kingdom to kingdom. And that king would offer that to the queen. Now let me, let me prove this to you in scripture. Because here the Bible says that King Solomon gave unto the queen of Sheba all her desire whatsoever she asked beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. There was something that was always exchanged from the royal bounty that would identify that king had given queen something that she could hold on to. Now's the time to give it to her. And all queen had to do is that if her kingdom ever got in a position that she needed the kingdom of Solomon, all she would have had to have done was show that whether it was a coin, a ring, a cup, I don't know what it was. I don't know what it could have been. But all she would have had to have done was take that, give it to one of her servants, send it to the king and say, this is what the king gave me. There's an alliance. There's a friendship. There's a fellowship. And that king would automatically respond with all of his armies, all of his navy, and everything that he had to offer in defense of his friend. Young people, do you understand that we are friends of a holy God? That we are friends to the king of all kings. And that the king has not given us a token. He has not given us just something. But he has given us a name that is above every name. He has given us something from the royal bounty. It's a name that nobody else... Oh, hallelujah, can carry like he carries. It's an authority that nobody else has like he has. And whenever we call on the name of Jesus, 
whenever we call on the name of the Lord, I'm telling you the angels of heaven back up. The angels of heaven step aside and the attention of the Lord Jesus which sits at the right hand of God is perked up and God begins to listen because we've called on the name of Jesus. Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of the great multitude for the battle is not yours but God's. God is simply saying to a younger generation all you've got to do when you get into the middle of a battle is call on my name. Begin to plead my blood. You talking about a royal bounty. The blood of Jesus that fell on that day where he was hung on a cross. All it took was one drop of blood. It was heavenly blood. It was royal. My God, I feel him. Young people, when you leave this place tonight, know that all you've got to do is call on his name. You go to school tomorrow. You go to school this year and hell rises up against you. Just speak the name of Jesus. You go into a world that begins to mock you and make fun of you because you know him. All you've got to do is begin to speak the name of Jesus. All you've got to do is prove to them that you've been to the throne room of the king. All you've got to do is say the name and it'll make the demons of hell tremble. Woo, hallelujah. Young people, there's power in the name of Jesus. There's authority in his name. You've got the power and the authority that he's given you through the power of the spirit that lives inside of you. Speak the name of Jesus. So tonight, as we go our way from this youth explosion, as we go to our different kingdoms or our homes, you don't be afraid to call on Jesus. Don't be afraid to call on that authority that's higher than you are. I've been to the throne room of the king this week. And whenever you've been to the throne room of the king, you can invoke the name of the king and all the kingdoms will tremble and fear at his name. You see, Solomon's kingdom was the, mass, the most massive kingdom that there was. He had a royal fleet of a navy. He had horsemen and chariots. He had armament. He had, he had it all. That's what made him the biggest and the baddest kingdom. I mean, he had wood that was in the temple like, like nobody else had. He had bounty like nobody else had. And the Bible said, it tells us this, that if we will call on the name of Jesus and we will petition heaven, that God can open up the windows of heaven and he will pour out blessings that we can't even contain. The Bible said that we can call upon the name of the Lord and we can be saved. The Bible says that in our times of trouble that we are the righteous and we can run into him and be saved. There's scripture after scripture that you can hold on to, young people. But when you can't quote the scripture, just call on his name. And it won't cost you a dime. You don't have to bring anything to God. All you've got to do is call on his name. There's some times that you feel broke as a joke. Amen. But all you've got to do is call on the name of Jesus. My God shall supply all of your need. We're not talking just about money. But all of my need according to his riches. You talking about a limitless bounty. Amen. All of his all of his riches and glory are standing waiting for you to call on his name and he'll pour them out on your life. My God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ask or think. We could go on and on with scripture after scripture. But as we leave this place tonight, we leave the house of the Lord, the sanctuary of our God. 
you know this, that as you enter back into the battlefield, when the battle's too big for you to handle, you call on the name of Jesus. Heaven responds. The Bible says that the angels of the Lord encampeth around about them that fear him. Sheba recognized the authority and the mass of Solomon's kingdom. She questioned him for answers, but she left with more than what she bargained for. Unlike Sheba, this ain't going to cost you a dime. All you've got to do is serve him. All you've got to do is make yourself available to him. You guys have been great. Thank you so much. You can keep that. Young people, it is imperative that you understand the power that you have through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There is not a devil in hell that can overtake you whenever you call on his name. Stand with me tonight. Pastor, we did it this morning, but can we do it again tonight? Can we ask every young person in this house to come and stand in this altar? And can we just surround you as you go back into a mission field? And can we surround you and pray over you and ask God to be the ever abiding presence in your life? Church, I want to ask you to come and let's just lay our hands on them and begin to pray. God's spoken to these young people this week. He's helped them in this altar. Right now, God, we ask your blessing. We ask your favor. We ask you, God, to open up doors for these young people. We pray, God, that you would close the doors that are not your doors. We ask you, God, that you would help them to be great students. But God, more than great students, we ask you, God, that they would be great believers, that they would be giant slayers, that they, Lord, would take on the giants that are in their life, that are facing their generation. God, I'm asking you tonight that you would shake their hearts and stir their souls constantly, that they would be in right relationship with you, Oh God, I'm asking you tonight, Lord, would you move by the power of your Spirit? Help them to receive. Help them to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. God, you're very present. You're always with us, Lord. Tonight, God, I ask you, help them to be aware of that. Father, touch tonight. We need you, Lord.
you've enjoyed this today, praise the Lord, amen. We've had a, a packed program, good to hear these wonderful testimonies and to hear our young people sing and uh, I was noticing Sister uh, uh, Jade up here in the choir tonight, just a smiling, I said we need to put her in the middle of the choir every service just to see that beautiful smile she has, amen. But everybody did a great job, thank you so very much, Brother Sister Gunner blessed us. They have about an hour and a half drive, so I told them they're, they're welcome to go ahead and take off with all the rain that's going on. But thank you so much for being a part of this youth explosion. Thank you, Beth and Ed and the youth board and all that you did to make it happen. Praise the Lord. It goes by so quickly, and it's all worth all the effort to see God working in the lives of our young people, praying that God will continue to bless. Don't forget, tomorrow's another day. And tomorrow, the Lord's blessings are still fresh and new. His mercy, His grace, He'll be with you tomorrow, just like He was with you today and throughout this weekend. Would you stand? We'll be dismissed. You can sit down or stand if you want, but uh, we got one more thing to take care of. I think um, Pastor Gunther uh, mentioned it before about the amount of work and effort that has to go into these events, the amount of planning that you don't see, that you don't hear of. Um, sometimes you're not even a part of, and you don't, you're, or you're a part of, and you don't even realize it. Um, but there's a lot of people behind the scenes that we know, like Amy Griffin and Paula, and people that served, you know. Lisa, people that cleaned up after the kids ate all the ice cream and made all the messes, you know, so all those people, we appreciate you so much. Um, but the leader of the gang, Beth and Ed, of course, Ed's not here tonight, so I hope he's feeling okay, but Beth, I, I, I don't know, there's just not the words, and I was honest, Pastor, I was looking, I think it's at the end of the book of John, or I don't know which book where he says if, if all these things were written down, there wouldn't be enough pages. I mean, th that's how I feel about Beth. If, if we try to write everything that Beth does for the youth group, everything she does for the church, for the choir, there ain't a book big enough to keep all those things. There's not enough adjectives, I think, in the dictionary to describe Beth, you know, and just how much she loves the Lord, how much she loves the youth, the choir, everybody. You know, and it's kind of like paying our tithes, right? We, we, we can't give enough back to the Lord for what he's given us. Beth, I can't give back enough for what you've given into our kids, you know, Carson and Cassidy and, and every, every one of the other youth that are here. But a little token, if you will, just to show our love and our appreciation. Thank you so much for this. I, my heart is with the youth, and I love them so much. Um, I believe in them. I know that they are capable, that they're able. Um, I believe that we have missionaries in this church, preachers in this church, worship leaders in this church. And I go to God, and I say, God, please, you 
use me to help them, rescue them from hell, rescue them from slipping into the world. And I need you to partner with us because I do get tired. And the enemy tries to tell me that my work is in vain, but I know he's a liar. And I won't give up on these kids. Past or present or future, they are my heart. I love spending time with them. It's like hanging out with my friends. I feel like I'm 15 again. And they'll tell you because I'll tell them stories and they laugh and make fun of me. But I believe in this generation. God has always had a people. I will not, with everything in me, not allow the enemy to take them. And I stand behind you, parents. I stand behind this church. I stand behind every young person, and I plead the blood over them, and I pray for them, and I know that God will use them, that he will raise them up. We will train them up. We will put the word in them so that it, his word will not return void. And they may go astray for a minute, but they will never forget, and God will never stop wooing them. And I thank you for the opportunity to serve. I'm not worthy. But I go because God has commissioned me to go. And I can't thank those who stand beside us, the youth board, Lenora and Kevin and Christina and Paula and Amy and Stephanie and Haley and Sonia. And you shoulder to shoulder with us. We can't do it without you. They are amazing. They think of things that I don't think of. Like Kevin mentioned, you know, I'm busy running around and they're cleaning up and they're looking after things. That is huge in the eyes of God because they're taking care of God's kids. They're taking care of kingdom business. And I thank my mom and dad for allowing us the opportunity to sponsor a youth function, to pour into these kids. And you, you the church, I thank you. And I thank you, Veronica and Caitlin. Caitlin was one of my kids, and Haley and Andy were in the youth ministry, and I love seeing them serve the Lord. I love seeing that they're not in the world, but they're in the church, and just standing with us in the youth group. You know, I love you, every one of you, so much. To God be the glory. Amen. A great investment and a phenomenal return to see what God does in the life of our young people. And one thing you want to know, and you need to know this up front, we pray for God to bless you, for him to bless you. So if you go astray, we pray for God to make you miserable. So which one do you want? You want the blessing or to be miserable? Can't eat, can't sleep, can't have every kind of problem you have till you get back to God. So you can, you can choose. If you're going to live right, we're going to pray, God bless you, bless you, bless you. But you go astray, you can be sure that we're going to be praying that you won't sleep, that you'll be miserable. I don't want to be miserable. I want to have joy and peace, and that's our prayer for our young people. The enemy is going to come against you, but God is our victor. This slogan has been fantastic. The battle belongs to God. Praise the Lord. Fellowship will be dismissed. God bless you. Good to have our guests. Thank you for coming and being with us tonight. <laughs>